All right, so where we are at today is that uh, I want to teach you about something called hashing. Um, before I start, I wanted to mention a couple things real quick. So the uh, seventh homework assignment has gone up as of today. Uh, it's called Trailblazer. I think Ashley might have shown you a demo of that a little bit during her lecture, right? It's a program where you uh, write graph task searching algorithms to find paths through mazes and other kinds of graphs. And so yeah, that's obviously it's a graph homework assignment based on the material that you learned in the past week. And that'll be the last homework assignment that we have in this class. We're getting close to the end, so uh, I know you're all excited to get done with the quarter and go on to spring break and stuff like that, right? So homework seven is up. It's due a week from Monday. It's due down here on the 12th of uh, March. And then, you know, in the meantime, it's always interesting, like, what do you do with the rest of the lectures, right? Because the homework, you've already got all you needed to solve the last homework, so what are we going to do? Well, we're going to hit some other special topics that we didn't have time for before, and all the stuff now, starting today, is not going to be used on your homework assignments, but it will potentially be on the final exam. So you still need to learn about it, I guess, is my point. And yeah, so a couple other things. Uh, I know that um, some of you have been checking on how you're doing in the class and asking questions about that. And uh, I believe, isn't it true that today is the last day to withdraw from a course, right? At, at 5 o'clock or something like that. So I certainly hope that none of you choose to withdraw. I hope you all stick around. But I think that you know, that's the deadline of that, if that's important news to you. Um, some people were asking about the grades that I posted on the class website. You know, How do we compute them? Or why isn't my grade higher? Or something like that. And uh, I think my short answer to that is just that the grades that I posted at that time were only based on homework one through three and the midterm and the sum of your sections. So there's a whole bunch of data that's still yet to be added to those numbers. So uh, you know, if, you, if you didn't love the number that you saw for your, your percentile or your grade or whatever, then uh, I would say there's still a lot of that story left to be written. But anyway, OK, so let me, let me start to teach you about hashing, OK? That's the subject for today. Um, and the big picture here, the context here, is that we have been learning how to implement all these different ADTs, all these different collections, right? <clears throat> so we learned how you implement vectors and lists. We learned how you implement a set using a binary search tree, right? So we've been learning all these different techniques. I want to talk about how the hash set and the hash map are implemented today. And it's a really cool idea. Really cool idea. And um, do you remember, uh, I told you the, the big O of adding and removing and searching in a hash set. What is that big O? It's O of 1. That's the best big O that there is, right? That's fast. So you know, I, I would hope that you would have some curiosity, like how do you make a set that has a constant time to search for things? How do you do that? I mean, if you just imagine ways of implementing a set, that doesn't seem like it would turn out that way. So that's what I want to teach you about today. So this comes from chapter 15 of the textbook. So let's imagine that we're trying to implement a set. Set of integers. Let's keep it simple. I, will, I promise we will come back to uh, how do you make a set or a list or whatever that has other kinds of data, like strings or something else. But start with a set of ints. OK, well, what if we basically store it the way that we've been learning, like the way that a vector is implemented or the way that the array stack was implemented, where you just add the element into the next available index? So if it's a set, internally, it's an unsorted, unfilled array like that. So what's the efficiency? What's the big O of add, remove, and contains? What's the big O of adding in this representation? O of 1? Yeah, because you just put it at the end. Occasionally, you need to grow the array, but that's rare, so it doesn't matter. Um, OK, what's the big O of contains? It's O of n. Yeah, because you've got to loop through all the elements to search for something, right? What's the big O of remove? O of n? Yes, for a couple of reasons. One is because if I ask you to remove the value 49, you have to go find it. And then once you find it, you have to pull it out of there and you have to like shift everything over probably, right? So yeah, for many reasons. So anyway, this representation is fast for adding, but it's slow for searching and removal. And I would claim the most important thing a set can do is the contains operation. Sometimes if adding is slow or removing is slow, you can tolerate that. So what you do is you sort of have a load up time where you build the set and maybe it takes a minute to add all the data to the set. 
but then searching it. If the searching is fast, that's what you really want, right? So the fact that contains this big O of N for a single search is really bad. Because we're only thinking, uh, big O only matters when n is a really big value, when n is a large number, right? So if you've got a billion elements and I have to look at all of them, that's no good. So I don't like this way of implementing a set. But okay, we learned about how you could implement a set using a binary search tree. What is the big O of add and remove and contains with a binary search tree? It's log of n. Log of n is way better than n. I think Ashley talked to you a lot about that already, right? That's pretty good. Log of n is pretty good. I want to explore, maybe we can do even a little bit better than that. So let's stay in the realm of arrays for a while, okay? Instead of an unsorted array, what if we have a sorted array? So in other words, when you add a value, I will figure out the right place to put it. I'll move everybody over and put it there. So if you said you wanted to, if you had that uh, array, and then you said you wanted to add the value 11, I would look around and figure out that the value 11 should go at index 3 in terms of the sorting here. Then I would move everybody over and put 11 at index 3 in, in that spot. So how long does it take to add something to that sorted array? Well, then, why is that? It's from the shifting, basically. In terms of like looking for where the right spot is, like discovering that it should go at index 3, that doesn't take O of n to determine that. Do you know why not? Do you have your hand up? Yeah, why? Or were you just stretching? Yeah, you can do a binary search on this, similarly to how you can do a binary search on a binary search tree. You can look at the middle and then jump left or right based on if it's bigger or smaller. You can use a binary search to find the right spot for insertion. That's log n, as you know. But then the actual insertion of the shifting and all that, that could be n if it's close to the start of the array, right? So it's kind of a log search plus an n shifting process, which adds up to be n. Do you have a question? Oh, the, uh, the, how, how does the array relate to pointers? Well, I mean, in C++, an array is implemented using a pointer, but the individual elements are not stored here as pointers the way a linked list would store them. All the elements are in a big chunk of memory of, of ints. So um, anyway, adding to this takes O of n on average because of the shifting. How long does it take to search for something, to contains? That? Log of n, right. That same binary searching process that you can use to find the spot for insertion, you can use that to hop around and see if a value is contained in the array or not, right? Okay, what about removal? How long does it take to remove? If I say remove the value 8 or remove the value 23 or whatever, yeah? N, why? It's a lot like add. You use a binary searching to find where the thing is. And then once you find it, you have to shift. The binary searching takes log. The shifting takes n. The sum of those is just n. So if you look at add contains and remove here, it's n log n n. If you compare it to the last one, the unsorted one, the unsorted one was big O of 1 n n. So if you kind of compare those two, they're both kind of bad. And you might say, well, wait, which one is more bad or less bad than the other? I would claim that this one is better because the searching is really important. The contains runtime is most important of all. So the fact that adding is slower here, adding with unsorted was O of 1. Adding here takes O of n, takes a lot longer. But I think it's worth it to get the faster contains, a lot faster contains. Remember, I don't know if you guys yet have a, a strong instinct for these different big O's. But like log of n is way, way, way less than n. Like the log of a million is 20. Log of a billion is 30. The log of a trillion is 40. Log is a lot smaller than n. So this is better, I think, because the searching is fast. Okay? But I think we can do better. 
And again, we'll, so the binary search tree that you learned with Ashley, with all the nodes in the left and the right and all that stuff, that's better than all this because that one is log n, log n, log n. So I hope you'll see that's better than either of these two that we saw so far, right? That's the best one we've seen so far. But if we're going to stick with arrays for a minute, is there any other, bless you, is there any other way we could do this as an array that would work really well? Well, let me show you a strange idea. This is the idea underneath hashing. What if you stored the value n at the index n? So instead of storing it in the first index, the second index, the third index, if you add the value 7, I will put it in the array at index 7. If you add the element 2, I'll store it in the array at index 2. Get it? Whatever you add, I'll put it at that index in the array. Kind of a weird idea, but I guess I could do that. If I did that, how long does it take to add something to the array? It takes a constant amount of time, right? Because you just sort of jump to the right index and you put the value there. You don't have to shift anybody. Uh, it takes a constant amount of time to jump to any particular individual index of an array. So adding, adding something to this weird idea would take O of 1. How would you do contains? If I said, does this array contain, does this set contain the value 7, how would you answer that question? And what big O would it take you? Like, what's, what's the process of contains here? Yeah. He says O of 1, you're exactly right. You just, if I want to know whether the set contains 7, I go to index 7 and see if there's a 7 there, right? And if there is, then the set contains a 7. <laughs> but if there's a 0 there, then nobody ever added a 7. And if, if I look at index 7, I entirely have the answer. I don't need to look at index 6 or index 8 or anywhere else, right? That's, if there's a 7 here, that's the only place it could possibly be, right? So adding O of 1, searching contains O of 1, how do you remove? I say, I don't want a 7 in the set anymore. Remove 7. What do you do? Just put a 0 there. How long does that take? What's the big O? Holy shit. <laughs> Add, remove, contains, big O of 1. Isn't this a great idea? This is kind of what hashing is. I can't think of any problems with this idea at all. Can you? Anything come to mind that, like, I want you to be skeptical and say, wait, this is bullshit. This doesn't work. Because why? What's wrong? Well, cats add zero or a negative number. OK, so there's some values that I can't really add to this. If you say add negative 2, there's no array index negative 2. OK, well, how about this? I want to hear all of your objections, and let's see if we can fix them. Because you're right. That's totally a problem. As described, my algorithm won't work for that. But if we could take all of your various objections and fix them, wouldn't we have a miraculously fast way of storing a set of ints after that? If we could find a way to fix problems like that? That's what a hash set is, basically, is this idea with all the problems fixed. <laughs> OK? So OK, I propose the following solution to your problem. I'll maintain two arrays, one for positives and one for negatives. So if you say negative 2, I'll store it in my second array at index 2. So that's the negative array. What's that? What about zero? Yeah, how do I know if zero is contained or not? Well, maybe in the zero index, I'll store a one if it's contained and a zero if it's not contained or something. I, maybe I can have a special case for zero where I store something in there that indicates whether it's there or not, right? Also, this whole idea would work fine. You could, you could just turn this into an array of Booleans, right, and turn them true or false or something. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Um, so I think so far so good. I think, I think we patched your, conceptually we patched the objection you raise. Any other problems here? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Like, uh, this is a neat idea for storing a set of ints, but how would I use that to store a set of strings or a set of doubles or a, like if it's doubles and I have 3.5 and 3.7, do I put them both in the, I can't put them both in the three bucket or whatever, you know, like what do you do? So uh, I, I want to come back to that if you don't mind. So maybe I'll adjust my, my phrasing here. I'll say, let's see if we can figure out how to make this work as a set of ints. And then if we do, there is a way to address that. But we'll come to it after we're convinced we can do this with ints first, right? Do you have any other objections to this? Uh, yeah, with the white. 
oh, what if I want to add a really large number, like set dot add uh, a million and 12, right? So now I have to have an array with a million and 12 indexes so I can flip the last one to have a value in it. And then all these other ones just have zeros in them. So that seems kind of wasteful, right? That seems like a big problem. OK, my solution to your problem is I buy more memory. And I have a lot of memory, so my array can be really big. It's OK. So that's my solution to your problem. Doesn't sound like a very good solution. Well, may, why don't we, we need to think about maybe a better solution than that. Um, in fact, even if the value isn't that big, like I guess I'm adding 18 and 12, and they wouldn't fit in here. That's kind of the same objection, right? It's out of bounds of the array here. So I guess what you could do is you could resize up to 20, and then you have enough space for the 18 or whatever. But it sure seems like an issue if you add a million, if you had a really, really big value. You're going to have a whole bunch of empty zero indexes, right? Well, what, what people end up really doing for that is they wrap it around. So they'll say, like, you know, you have 1,000 indexes, and if you want to store a value 0 to 999, you can do it. But if you want to add the value uh, 1,543, you kind of wrap it back around and just store it in, in index 543. You sort of mod it by the 1,000 of their array size. And so it goes there. We've got, that introduces a different problem, but that's kind of a hack people use to get around this issue. Well, uh, let me show you kind of a little more about this idea. This is called hashing. So, uh, you know, this phrase, this, this word hash gets used a lot in computer science. Like you talk about hash tags or whatever. It's nothing to do with that. Or the hash character on the keyboard has nothing to do with that. But uh, it does, it is the same hash as like hash map, hash set, hash table. If you've heard those kind of phrases before, this is the hash I'm talking about. Um, in general, the definition of hashing is when you map a large domain of values into a smaller fixed domain, typically a domain of integers. So um, you map all ints into a small set of indexes that you can use as array indexes for storing them. And the array that you use to store these values is called a hash table. And the process by which you do the mapping is called a hashing function. Basically, if I give you this element that you want to add to the set, and then you tell me what index it should go at, that mapping from piece of data to index is called a hashing function. So our algorithm was to get the hashing code or hash value for a given int, you just return that same int. And you guys brought up some really good objections to that. So um, it doesn't work for negatives. It could have a lot of zeros. And it might require a really large uh, array. Those are some of the things you guys brought up, right? OK, so let's patch our function to work for some of those cases. So one is you just take the absolute value. I mentioned I could have a second array for negatives, but another way to do it would just be to absolute value them. So if you say you want to add negative 2, I can just put it in index 2. The other thing I could do in terms of values being too large is I could just wrap them around. I said that a minute ago. So if you want to add 37, I'll just store it in index 7. If you want to add 49, I'll store it in index 9, because that's 49 mod uh, 10. OK? So the hashing function, you might say, is absolute value of the element uh, mod the array capacity. So now what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this version? Somebody haven't told me. Yes? Yeah. So the 2 and a minus 2, like the same That's right. Now there's multiple different values that hash into the same index. That if I try to add a negative 2 and a 2, or a 37 and a 47 and a 57, all of those values want to go to the same index. I have to deal with that problem. The issue of multiple values hashing into the same index is called collisions. Is that my next slide? Uh, it's not. But what, before, I, before I talk about that collision, I just want to point out like this idea, taking the elements and storing them in the hash indexes of an array, this is big O of 1, right? All of these things are big O of 1 because you just go to the index. You don't have to loop over any other indexes. That's what we talked about earlier. So like, this is essentially the algorithm. Adding means go to the index of the hash code and store the value at that index. Contain says go to the index and see if that number is stored to that index. Remove means set it back to zero. Do you see, like, that's all you'd have to do, right? And I hope you can see that all those are big O of 1, because there's no loops and there's no recursion. There's nothing that would slow us down here, right? Big O of 1. But the biggest problem that we still have with this is this issue of multiple values that might bump into each other and go to the same index. 
That is called a collision. So when you're implementing a hash set, you have to come up with some way of dealing with collisions. You can't just ignore them, because if I just ignore them, I'll overwrite values. Do you see that uh, in the third line, I add the value 24? And then on the fifth line, I add 54. And oops, I overwrote the 24 with a 54. So now if you ask me whether 24 is in the set, I don't know. Right? I see a 54. I don't see a 24. So I don't, I don't know the answer. I lost information. This is not OK, right? OK, so how do you deal with collisions? Well, there's different ways that you can do it. There's different collision resolution strategies. Again, we're trying to patch this idea so that it'll still work. One way of dealing with collisions is called probing. Probing is where you just put the element in the next index. I don't really like this idea, but it's, you could do this. <laughs> so like, imagine that you add 24 at index 4, and now you want to add 54. You go to add it in the 24 index, and you say, oh, it's taken. So you just go to the next one. You just put it in the next one. I'm trying to think of a real world analogy for this. Like if you went to your dorm freshman year and somebody was already there and you just moved into the next dorm or something, it's now somebody else's problem, right? Um, so you can do that. That's one way of resolving collisions. The only problem with this is that um, now it's harder to like search for things. I mean, now if I ask you whether 54 is contained in the set, what does the code need to do? Do you contain 54? What do I do? Yeah? Well, look at 54 and, 54 and mod the capacity, and then the every other index after. Right. So what I do is I start out by using my hash function that tells me to go to index number 4. So I go there, and I see I'm looking for 54. I go to index 4, I see 24. That's the wrong value. But instead of stopping and saying, nope, it's not contained here, I have to keep moving forward to see if it's following that. So I have to keep moving forward until what? Thanks, until I find it, in which case, yes, that's contained. Or I reach, a, I think if I reach a zero, that means that it couldn't be here because it would have landed in one of those indexes prior to a zero, right? So the algorithm for add, remove, and contains is a little different because you have to like hop ahead and look at these indexes. But wait, if you're hopping ahead looking at other indexes, that's probably like a loop, right? And doesn't that sound like it's starting to get away from the big O of one business here? Uh-oh. Loops are bad if you want big O of one, right? <coughs> of course, I hope what you learned from those weird big O questions on the midterm is that not every loop means that something becomes big O of n. It depends on the number of things that you're looping over, right? So do these little loops, like if I have to loop a couple times here, does that make adding or searching become big O of n? What do you think? I mean, just what's your, what does your instinct tell you about something like that? What do you think? If it's a for loop of a constant, like for, like for i, then i is less than psi, that's safety, right? You don't actually change the array size, then that thing's going to work. Yeah, you said if it's only looking at a constant, like a couple of elements, then it's probably not big O of n. Yeah, I think the answer to that would be then, how long are these clumps of elements expected to be? Is it only going to be a couple elements clumped together, or is it going to be a whole big train wreck of all kind of elements and you have to loop over half the array? So I guess it depends. These little clumps of elements, do I have a slide on this? These clumps of elements are called clusters. And so basically, if the clusters got too big, then we wouldn't have big O of 1 anymore. It would be close to big O of n. But as long as the clusters were just real short, we'd be OK. So I don't know if I like that, but I'm a little concerned about the, the big O here. But like, I've gone out of my way to make up numbers that would collide with each other a lot here, so that this cluster would be really long. So if you ask me whether the set contains the value 94, I have to start at index 4, and I have to go all the way to 9. Uh, and I think even I'd have to wrap around to 0 even to see if I could find it there. So I mean, that, that's kind of bad, right? Um, yeah, question. To, to this, with this existing data, then uh, next I will add 16. Right, so what I would have to do is, if you want to add 16 to this, you go to 6, index 6, that's the hash index. And you say, oh, it's full. Go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next, until you find a 0. And I go all the way to 9, I wouldn't find a 0. I would wrap around to index 0 and put the 16 there. So it's pretty far from home, right, where you'd end up storing it. Um, now, one thing you could do to reduce the amount of these clumps is you could have a different array size. I've chosen 10 just because I have to draw PowerPoint slides. It's hard to show 
50 indexes on a tiny PowerPoint slide. But like if the uh, array size was 20, I hope that you can see that some of the clumping would go down because like 24 and 86 and stuff, they'd be down in the four and six indexes. But like 14 and 54, they'd be up in the 14 index because that's their mod of 20. Do you know what I mean? So like having a different array size or a bigger array size would help somewhat with this problem. Anyway, that's one way of resolving collisions. That's not the way that I think is the best way, though. I want to show you a different way. Uh, the way that I think works better is called chaining, separate chaining. This is where at each index of the array, instead of storing a single value, you store a small list of values, typically implemented as a linked list. So a hash table turns into an array of linked lists of integers. Um, so I guess if you want to take this picture literally, like index zero is a linked list of all the ints in the set that end with a zero. And index one is a linked list of all the ints that end with one and so forth. And that's because you know, I chose an array size of 10 here. So you make some sort of little node, like a hash node. This is basically the same as a linked node, a linked list node. You have a data and a next. You just chain them all together. So now you don't have to like, look at the next index or whatever. You know, if you say, do you contain 54? You go to the linked list in index four and you loop over it and you see if 54 is in there or not. That's all you do. You don't have to go to index five or index six or any of that. So I like this one better. The other thing, I, I don't know if I mentioned, I don't think I said this, but if you're using this, uh, this um, probing model, you can run out of space. Do you see this? Where like if you, if you run out of indexes, you don't have anywhere to put anything anymore. So you can make the array bigger to deal with that problem, but you could actually end up with a cluster that's like the length of the whole array. That would be bad. So the thing about this one that's kind of nice is you technically never run out of space. You just can keep lengthening these lists as long as you need to. Okay, so this is a good solution to uh, the collision problem, but it does still have that loop and big O issue that we've been talking about. Like if you added, if all the values that you added ended with a four, you know, 24, 54, 14, 114, 184, all values that end with a four, do you understand that all of them would be in the same index of the hash table? And therefore, you're basically just storing your set as a one linked list. And so if I ask you if it contains something, you have to loop over like all of them, do you understand? So like, that seems like that's not big O of one anymore, right? So I don't know if you still believe me that we can do this whole big O of one business here. I mean, I seem to have made slides about it, so there must be something we could do. But um, I guess my point is that, you know, if the data is all clumped together, that would be bad. So one way we could make it clump together a little bit less would be to pick a different size for our hash table. The fact that I chose size 10 is actually kind of a bad choice because that means all the numbers that end with the same digit value would all line up together. That seems kind of too clumpy for me. And uh, you'd probably would pick something like size 17 or 51 or something. And the reason you would pick a weird number like that would be then the modding and the wrapping is pretty chaotic. Like if you take all these values I've written here and check what all their mods are when you mod them by 17, they don't collide nearly as much because that's just a weird random number, prime number that I chose, you know? But anyway, that's kind of how you do this in practice is you store these little linked lists of, of data. And as long as the linked lists are pretty short, which they, will be for most data, then basically these add and remove and contains operations are big O of one. Big O of one doesn't mean that it only looks at a single element. It just means that it doesn't have to look at more, statistically more elements when n is larger. Okay, so how do you add something? If you're doing this representation with the chaining, with the linked lists in each index, how do you add something to a hash table? I've got a new value, I'm adding 24. So I think you guys already understand that I'm gonna to go to index number four and I'm gonna put it there, right? Where in that chain should I put it? After 14, at the end? It, that would certainly be correct. I think there's an even better place to put it than that. What? In the beginning. In front of 54. Why is that better? Yeah, because we're talking about a linked list here, right? So all I have is this little front pointer. To walk to the end of the chain to attach 24 to the end, that would take me time, right? Because I have to next, next, next. I have to walk to the end, right? 
I don't want to do that. And the order of a chain doesn't really matter. Just store everybody that's, uh, that's got that mod. It's fine. The order doesn't matter, right? So just put it at the front. Do like this. Make his next be 54 and make the start of the list be him. You guys know how to insert at the front of a linked list. You've done that before plenty of times. How long does it take to insert something at the front of a linked list? Big O. One, right? No loop. Just change the front pointer. You're done. So I'm trying to convince myself that if we do this, we will have add and remove and contains that will be big O of one runtime. I know, I can, I'm convinced that add is big O of one because of these pictures and what we're talking about right now, right? How about contains? How does contains work? Well, if you ask me if it contains 14, I know it'll be in index four, right? So you guys know, it's just I'm searching through a linked list. So I make a current pointer. I point it to the front of the linked list. You guys have written code like this plenty of times, right? While uh, I haven't found the data or null, next, 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 aha, I found it, return true, right? So I need a loop for contains. Um, the only issue though is that, uh, you know, the loop that I'm doing is not going to be big O of n because I'm assuming that the elements are kind of spread out. So not all n of them are in any one bucket, right? Okay. And then remove is pretty simple too. Remove is just, you guys know how to remove from a linked list. You just uh, make the pointer point around it. So if I want to remove 54, go to the node before 54 and then make its next pointer point around 54 to the one after that, right? It's typical just linked list stuff. So that's it. That's how you implement a set as a hash table. So I want to do that with you guys, or at least try. Uh, I want to try to write a hash int set that has add and remove and contains. Uh, for time, we might just do add and contains, because I think those are the two that are most interesting maybe. But uh, let, let's go see if we can do this. So if you, if you go to Qt Creator, um, I got a project posted for today that has a file called hash int set. Uh, and hash int set, I've got this hash node here, which is just a data and a next, data and next. And I want to implement these methods, constructor, add, contains, and so on, okay? Um, now down here, I'm going to write this as a, you know, we, we implemented array-based collections before. And you typically have three fields, right? You have a, an array for the data. You have a capacity that tells you the length of the array. And you have a size that tells you how many values you have actually added. So we did that with array stack. You, I assume, did that with your array priority queue and your heap priority queue. So those three, that particular trio of private variables should be somewhat familiar to you. Perhaps the one thing that's confusing is why is this a hash node star star? Oh God, we're doing double pointers now, Marty. <laughs> why? <laughs> At least you showed me this horror before the drop deadline, Marty. What's a hash node star star? Why did I write that? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So so like if you want an array of ints in Java, you say int bracket bracket. But in C, you say int star. The star sort of means bracket bracket, right? So if I want an array of hash nodes, what I really want is an array of front pointers, right? Each of these ten is a front pointer. That's what the array is really storing. So I really want hash node pointer. I want an array of those, right? But in C++, you write that bracket bracket as a star. So it's hash node pointer array. That's what that is. Um, so I call it hash table. And now over here in the constructor, I just set that to be, uh, what do I call it, hash table. It's a new array of hash node pointers of size 10. OK? Mm -hmm. All 10 of them are null. So I want to write add, remove, and contains. Let's talk about add for a second. So if you want to add a value, like this is them saying, you know, hash set dot add 37 or whatever, right? So tell me, tell me some stuff I need to do here if I'm going to add the value 37. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. It should be hash node star 10. Yeah, I need 10 pointers. Thank you. 
help me add something to this set. How do I do it? First of all, where am I going to put this value? How do I know where to put it? Yeah? Yeah, let's get the hash code. In other words, like the, the int, you know, take this value and map it to what index is the right index. That's that hashing function, hash code. Um, so in our slides, we already talked about what the hashing function is. It's way back wherever. It's uh, here. The absolute value of the int mod by the capacity of the array. We already talked about that before, right? So I took the liberty of putting that in this file. I wrote a function called hash code here. And hash code returns absolute value of the value mod the array capacity, right? So I can call hash code. So now up here, if I want to know where to put this thing, I'll say int uh, hash equals hash code of value. So if that was 37, that would give me like a 7 back, right? OK, so that's where in the array to put this. Do I say hash table bracket hash equals value? That's kind of what I'm trying to do, but that's not quite the right uh, syntax. What else? What am I missing kind of here? Yeah? While hash table with hash is not pointing to the null pointer, you, oh wait, we're at it. So we're going to change the pointer so not the first, we insert the first thing out as node. Right, right. So we need to make a hash node. Basically this picture that I drew here, if I'm making a new node, I have to make a new hash node, and then I have to insert that hash node at the front of the chain of that uh, bucket in the array. If there's nothing there, that's fine. It'll become the only element of the array. So I think I want to do something like this. Um, hash node star new node is a new hash node that stores this value. And I mean, basically, I'm going to say hash node hash equals new node. But I'm still missing because like, there might already be some stuff in the linked list. I don't want to lose it. Do you understand? The code I've written now would replace any previous content with just this node. So what's missing? Like in terms of this picture here, I made this new node and I'm changing this pointer to point to the new node. What's missing? Yeah. I, I need to attach from this guy to the rest of what was there before. So I think what I need to say is new node next equals what's currently the front of this chain. And now attach the there. So this inserts this guy at the front of the linked list. OK? So I'll just write insert at front of list. Uh, I think I could be wrong, but I think I set this up so that even if all we wrote was add, I could run it and it would just print out the table. Let me see if that's true. Uh, wait, add before. Oh, I think I need to. Um, Sorry, wait, what's wrong with this? Um, I have a main here. And I think, what am I doing here? I'm making a set, and then I'm adding them. Oh, do I have to press enter after each add? <laughs> wow, cool, it crashed. Do you have to initialize the size? Yeah, I think I didn't set the other uh, private variables. I think that's what's going on here. So up in the constructor, the size is 0 and the capacity is 10. I think without those being set, the main is barfing, basically. So, OK. I tried to set this up so I could see before and after. I'm going to add 17. Ready? And then I press Enter. There he is. Add 41. There he is. Add 9. There he is. Add 29. Put him at the front. Add 41 again. Oops. Well, I probably shouldn't do that because that's a duplicate. Maybe we can fix that in a second. Add 9 again. Oops, duplicate. Add 29. Oops. Add 37. There he is. So you might say, wait, how is that printing? I just wrote some helper to print the array. I, I wrote that before class. That's not some magical command or whatever. But do um, you see, like, that's what our code is doing. Insert these new guys at the front of these linked lists. Add 81. Goes there. So far, so good? Other than duplicate, we have a pretty good add function. Let's write to do prevent duplicates. Because our, our test showed that we were able to add two of the same value. We probably shouldn't do that, right? OK, now let's do contains. Let's do contains. Help me out. You see add, you know how we added things to the hash set. Now how do we search for things in the hash set? Tell me some code I could write.
What do you think? Okay, sure. Let's go get this hash code again. I'll give you a hint. You know how with recursion, you always say base case or whatever, right? There's certain common themes. When you're dealing with a hash set, you almost always grab this like hash code first because that's kind of the bucket, the place of the collection do you want to deal with. So, okay, I'm there. Now what do I do? So I'm doing contains. I mean, basically it's this here. I know now that I'm searching for like 84. So I've calculated that that's going to be in index number four. So now what do I need to do? Yeah. Loop through the linked list, traverse it, look for that value that they're asking about. So you guys know how to traverse a linked list. You say hash node current or temp or something equals the front of that chain at that index. The front of that chain is called hash table hash. This is an array of front pointers. So that one is the front pointer of, of interest. So you said traverse the list. I know how to traverse a linked list while current isn't null pointer. I would do something, but then I would do cur equals cur next, right? We've done a million linked list loops like that. What am I doing as I visit each of these indexes? What goes in the question mark part? Yeah? If the current node has data equal to the value that I'm searching for, then yes, this uh, set does contain this value, right? So in other words, that would be like if you're searching for 84, I'm looping saying, is current data equal 84? No? OK, next. Is current data 84? No? Next, and so on. Stop when you find it or stop when you find no. That's right. And then if I get all the way to the end and I didn't return anything, then I know it's not there and I should return false. Right? That's it. That's how to do it. I think that looks right to me. Um, hey, maybe that'll help us up here with this to do. Prevent duplicates. How do I prevent duplicates? Yeah? Yeah, that's exactly right. Just call contains. Just, you know, if I contain this value, return. Don't, don't add it again. Um, that's a little bit, you know, you might say, well, what, don't I have to walk the chain and look for it or what? That's okay. The chains are short. Don't worry about that. So, yeah, um, let's run it again and test it. So add 17, it goes there. Add 41, it goes there. Add 9, it goes there. Add 29, it goes there. Add 41 again. Didn't do it. Add 9 again. Didn't do it. Bless you. Add 29 again. Didn't do it. Add 37. Goes there. So I think we've got like add working pretty well. And I mean implicitly it looks like contains is working because we're not adding these duplicates. But I think I have some explicit tests on contains in a second. Oh man, this takes forever. Uh, okay, contains 41. True. Contains 9. True. Contains 29. True. Contains 41. True. So I mean these are the guts of how a hash set works. And I don't know if you believe me that this is big O of one because, I mean, I think when you look at this picture, it's not totally convincing that it would be big O of one because you'd say, wait, a lot of the data is clumped in index number five, right? So I don't know about that. Okay, but what I said a few minutes ago was that the, the size of the hash map, hash set uh, being 10, was picked just so I could explain this to you, so I could draw pictures of it, and you would, it's easy to compute mod 10. Even at Berkeley, they can mostly follow along with a lecture on that, mostly. But um, what you really do, if you don't want quite so much clumping, let me try to fix that right now, just to quickly kind of illustrate. How about instead of 10, let's do 17, okay? Just different number, not quite as round of a number, you know? I don't, this isn't going to totally fix the clumping. In fact, I didn't test this ahead of time, but okay, wait, I got to resize this a little so you can see it here. Okay, let's try 17, add 41 goes there, add 9 goes there, add 29. Do you notice that 9 and 29 don't conflict anymore? They just happen, They're, 29 mod 17 is 12, right? So it's just, it's a, it, doesn't, it doesn't collide in the same way that it used to. 41, add 9, add 29, add 37, add 81, add 69, add 20. Now look, I got a collision, 20 and 37, so I still got one. But do you at least see that like the number of these collisions is way less, way fewer when I choose like a weird array size? 
And so if you go digging around in the source code of like an actual hash set, like the one in our library or the one that comes with Java or Python or whatever, you'll find that they pick a really weird size, like 137 or something. And when they resize, they jump by 3.2 or some weird, you know, they pick weird sizes because it just generally makes it more likely that the data will spread out nice and evenly like this, okay? And you'll still have these chains, you'll still have a couple people, but like you'll find that you can add quite a lot of data and you only have a chain of like two or three in most cases, I would say, okay? So that's a basic idea of how a hash set works. Uh, I've got a couple more minutes I want to talk about, but do you have any questions so far about what we've been doing or how this works? There you go. Oh, what's the size? Yeah, right now it says size zero. That's just because I forgot to say plus plus. Like basically when you do add, you could just say my size plus plus, and then the size will go up. Like I guess you could imagine like looping and looking at all the nodes and counting them, but that, that takes a lot of time, so I would just keep a int uh, field for, for that. So let me, let me point out something. Remember how when you print out a hash set, it just like all jumbled up, right? The order is weird. And I said, oh, it's unpredictable order. Do you see why that's happening now? If I were to print that, I would probably start at the top and loop down going to the right. So the order they would print would be 17, 69, 20, 37, 55, 5. Pretty random looking, isn't it? It's not random. It's totally based on this hashing algorithm. It's printing all the ones whose mod of 17 is 0 first, and then all the ones whose mod of 17 is 1 next. So it's not random but it's gibberish looking to somebody who hasn't learned about hashing yet, right? So that's why when you print those collections out, they look so weird. Uh, I'm almost out of time. The last thing I'm gonna tell you, I mean, that's the main idea of how a hash set works. The last thing I'll say is when you, where am I, here. When, when the hash set gets too big, you know, we always have this notion of like when you have an array, it's too full, you resize the array. Now I hope you could see that you actually never need to resize because you could just let the chains grow longer and longer and longer as long as you want. But I hope you'll see that at that point the big O starts to get sucky because you're looping over these long chains. So you can resize, which as you saw just now, if I change the array size, it can spread the elements better. That's called rehashing. But rehashing is non-trivial because like let's say you have a chain there like, uh, uh, you know, you have a chain in index four of 24, 54, 14. If you resize from size 10 to 20, you have to move some of those guys from index 4 to index 14 because their mod changed. So when you resize a hash table, you actually have to go look at all the elements and move them to the new index that's correct for them. You understand if this array were size 10, those yellow ones would be over here on the left part. But now that you resize to 20, they go over there. So resizing a hash table is a little bit less trivial than resizing a regular vector array or something like that. Okay, I'm out of time for today. Please have a wonderful weekend and uh, get started on Homework 7 and we'll see you next week. Thanks. <laughs>